Um, so this is panel number three. The title is Adapting Medical Technology to a Cost-Transparent Future. So with the increased focus today on cost transparency in healthcare, it's causing a shift in the marketplace. So today, patients have increasing access to price information and comparison data, and that's empowering them to make decisions and demands regarding their personal health. And honestly, probably everyone in this room is a patient, so we are being empowered with this information. And so how will this inform patient that we now are? What will that mean for med tech companies? So the goal of this panel is to discuss the changing environment in healthcare and explore how med tech is adapting to succeed. I'd like to introduce uh, your moderator, Afsana Namula. She's a partner at Marlin and Associates, a financial strategic and strategic advisory firm and, and investment bank. Afsana is an accomplished global technology and healthcare IT executive and investment banker. And she's not new to it either. She's been doing this for over 25 years. <laughs> She currently focuses, her age would not, you know, would not be able to tell at all, but she focuses on M&A, capital raises, and corporate strategy for emerging next generation healthcare IT companies. And she is also the editor of Marlin's monthly newsletter, HIT Greatest Hits. So it's my pleasure to invite Afsana to the stage. The panelists will join later. The panelists will come later. All right, can, can you please join me? You know, I have to say, you all look great. You really do. It's, it's, I get so energized when I'm amongst a group of accomplished women. I just want you to know you all exude great energy. Pleasure to be here. We've only ever talked on the phone. <laughs> Who is the last one? Okay. Sorry, guys. Uh, all right. Got it. All right. I have a few senior moments, so I want to make sure that I got I got this all uh, figured out. All right. Again, thanks for uh, joining us here. Um, you know, I like to start telling you one of the jokes um, um, that I heard. Um, we lost her, uh, Joan Rivers, I think big tragedy, but I loved her one-liners and I loved her jokes. And one joke she has has some relevance to healthcare. She said, you know, People think, they always tell me, money does, is not the key for happiness. Well, I disagree. I feel like I could have so much money, I'm gonna have that key made. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? We have thrown so much money at healthcare and we have not made that key. But having been around technology now for over 25 years, and I have to say I'm an early adopter geek, I used the internet when, when there were no browsers. I, I was on server number 77, and I remember typing in, is anybody out there? <laughs> and then one or two times, a few DOD people call me and say, who are you, and why are you on this network? Well, we have come a long way. Um, we have definitely come a long way. So in reflecting on price transparency, I started to think, I'm a little bit philosophical, guys, so just Bear with me, I'm a yogi. So, um, so I was saying to myself, you know, student of economics, a lover of technology, why is, well, I can see why food prices are rising because we are not producing enough. Population is growing. I kind of can see why real estate prices rise because demographic shifts, some cities are more, you know, in favor than others. But why is healthcare cost is rising? It's not just because we have more people, but healthcare cost per individual is still under rise with all this amazing technology we have. So what the hell is going on here? And this has a relevance to price transparency, just bear with me. And you know, I, I, 
after all, nearly two and a half decades, I have a, I feel it in my bones that finally I think we are at an inflection point. Finally, we are at the confluence of technology, point of confluence of technologies that I think the cost curve is gonna bend. And there are a couple of things that are gonna bend that cost curve. I think mobility, you know, I, I started banking when we used to send telexes to each other. Oh my God, let's send a telex to London office. It was a big deal. I remember days, Afsani is talking to London. It's a long distance call. Don't interrupt her. It's really expensive. And that's where, how I started my profession. And look at where we are with technology. Look at how omnipresent technology is. Look at our, the level of our productivity. Just simple email and mobility. Why mobility is going to bend the uh, cost curve? Wireless internet. You know, my daughter is 19. I'm glad to say that next week I'm bringing her over to go to Stanford as a freshman, so I'm very pleased. <laughs> and uh, she'll be amongst all your wonderful people. Um, you know, she grew up with wireless internet. Do you know what that means? Wireless internet. She grew up with it. So people like her, people her age, and I would say up to about you know, 18 and 30, 35 year old, these guys will bend the car cost curve because they know how to use mobility. They grew up with it. It's like, you know, it's, a, it's basically a second hand for them. I think that's definitely gonna uh, bend the cost curve. The other thing that is gonna bend the cost curve is what I call data democratization. What does that mean? So when you have CMS opening their data and saying here is all the charges that, you know, all the procedures and prices that Medicare pays for, dump it on the internet. You guys can go and analyze it. Data, that's a data democratization. My God, can you imagine US government opening up their pricing data for Medicare? When the a hospital executive says, you know what? I want to compete with other hospitals. I am going to put my prices for all these procedures and, and people should be able to shop and I want to be one of those facilities that provide this. Well, he has a problem, which I think big data is going to solve them. A lot of hospitals don't know what the cost of a cardiology surgery, you know, open heart surgery is. And there are people, analytics companies out there like Health Catalyst and others that now are doing all these analytics with hospitals and saying, hey, Mr. CEO, did you know, by the way, that cardiology, yes, it is your highest revenue producer, but did you know that it has a lousy profit margin as on a fully loaded basis? You better reprice your open heart surgery. So, uh, so that CEO is so anxious to participate in this marketplace of putting out his prices. So, so we got the government, we got the providers, and my God, can you believe the payers are doing that as well? I mean, payers are, you know, I've dealt with them for a long time. They're the most secret, they're worse than CIA, I swear to God. And, you know, they have these secret meetings with the CEOs of, of, of you know, providers saying, you know, let's negotiate how much I'm going to you know, reimburse you for, uh, you know, open heart surgery or knee replacement. Now, you know, all of a sudden that kimono is wide open because they have no choice. Data democratization. Why do we have data democratization? Because we have the internet. I just had a little interview. I said, you know, 15 years ago, a very wise man told me, internet over everything and everything over internet. That's why we have them, data democracy. The, you know, train has the, left the station. There is no way to stop this wave. When you can't stop a wave, call me because I'd like to know how you're gonna do that. So I think, um, and then, you know, the payer was, was the last bastion of opening up their data. And, you know, so lots of lots of price, transfer, price transparency data is out there, but people, Obviously, like Lisa and others are, are going to ha have a meaning, you know, what, what the heck, you know, okay, fine. It's like, oh, you know, knee replacement caused that. But what about value-based price transparency? What about, you know, if you're a diabetes and have these other contiguous risks, what are the, not the, what's the cheapest price, but what's the best price, what's the best facility, and what's that price? So we have a long, long way, go way to go with price transparency, but, you know, Data democratization, prices, costs, just one or two vectors. We're gonna have some of the most exciting years ahead of us because 
the door is open, the kimonos are open, so there is software, there are a confluence of technologies that are gonna help analyze and really give us a lot of data, most of which is gonna be on my, our mobile devices. So I'm very, very grateful that I was asked to moderate this panel because my first reaction was, what the hell does price transparency have to do with medtech? Well, you know what, a lot. And we're gonna hopefully help you find out why we say that. And you know, we have a great panel. Every single of these ladies I've spoken to on the phone, they're you know, very, very accomplished ladies. They have opinions. And I uh, you know, would like to start by introducing each panelist. After that, we're gonna go to Q&A. And then please, you know, if time permits, uh, we would love to hear questions from you as well. So what I'd like to ask the panelists is I'm gonna in introduce each by name and your position. And then after all the panelists have introduced themselves, starting with you, Lisa, then maybe you can talk about your bio. Well, actually, you know what, why don't we just introduce each with your bio and then we go down. The best, probably the best, best uh, way of doing it. So Lisa, I don't think needs an introduction. <laughs> she, she gave us one of the most inspiring talks uh, uh, today. So uh, please, Lisa, if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and, uh, and also just a quick, um, uh, uh, for those of us who were not here, brief about the company and then we'll, we'll go on. My name is Lisa Mackey. I am the co-founder and CEO of Pocket Doc. We are a health marketplace. We connect consumers directly to health providers, both medical and uh, holistic, to shop for typically non-acute care, anything that can be easily predicted and priced. We let consumers buy products and services directly in the marketplace. We, uh, for providers who sell directly in the part marketplace, they get their cash right away. We also provide an API that gives access to all of the services underlying that, everything that supports that from an eligibility check to the cost of a shoulder replacement. We give you access to that as well. Uh, other than that, I think you know everything. I, uh, I, I, this is my second startup with the same co-founder. My co-founder is a man, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we like to call, I like to call it the marriage with no benefits whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and before that, uh, worked at Microsoft, ran my own business, and, and then worked at Microsoft again. Thank you. Tamra Fuller-Rook uh, is a VP of Health Economics and Reimbursement at Nevro. Tamra? I am. Hi, I'm Tamra Rook. I'm with Nevro, which is uh, located here in Menlo Park. We have an implantable spinal cord stimulator um, that is uh, commercialized in Europe and Australia right now. So we're ready, getting ready to launch that here in the U.S. My background, um, I started out in the uh, payer world uh, in 1994, and from there I went to the provider world, and about 10 years ago I went to medical device, and I spent a number of years at Medtronic in neurostimulation, and a couple years at Cyberonics uh, before I made my way to Nevro. Thank you. And uh, Anya Scheiss is VP Device and Diagnostics at Cardinal Health. Yes, hi, so I'm Anya Shis, uh, work at Cardinal Health. Actually just moved over from medical diagnostics and devices to our uh, hospital supply and services businesses, which is the bulk of Cardinal's business. It's, if you know us for anything, it would be what you know us for, so the delivery of, of products to, um, to hospitals and ambulatory care centers. So just a couple of quick facts about Cardinal. We do over 100,000 unique deliveries a day to different uh, healthcare entities in the U.S. We touch 98% of all hospitals in the U.S. We may not be a prime distributor for them, but we touch them uh, at least once a week, 98% of hospitals in the U.S. Uh, we have a large ambulatory and physician office uh, practice as well. Um, we're the largest direct employer of pharmacists in the US, which most people don't know, but a lot of independent pharmacies actually um, use us for, for staffing, and so we provide their pharmacists. It's on the pharma side of the business. I'm on medical, but it's sort of an interesting fact. Um, and then also, we sell over $5 billion in medical worth of products uh, a year. So most people think of us as distributors, which is a big, important business for us. 
Um, but selling products is a very big business for us as well. We sell both consumable products, so bandages, crutches, things like that, uh, as well as implantable products, as well as, as um, products that are used during surgery, so instrumentation, monitors, things like that. I've been in uh, health, I'm a complete healthcare nerd, always been in healthcare. Um, helped to co-found a company back in 96, which was in the orthopedic space, and have sort of played in different parts of healthcare ever since. Thank you. And our last speaker is um, Sue Heilman, who is a senior director of business economics at Medtronic. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, I am a nurse by training. So I started off in the hospital space, obviously, on the cardiac uh, specialty area. And as we were joking at lunch, uh, you know, if you have some uh, level of clinical capability, they promptly move you into management where you have no idea what you're doing because you've had no formal training. So, uh, you know, being in a, a strategic planning effort and knowing the answers, but perhaps not articulating them as well. I went to Carnegie Mellon and got my business degree. Uh, within the hospital space, it was quite an interesting time. Uh, without dating myself, I was there whenever coronary interventions were just coming into their own. So yes, I too am older than dirt. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the, it also afforded me a lot of opportunities. I was able to step out and do some consultation on behalf of the hospital and then ultimately made the leap to uh, a startup company with uh, kind of a boutique cardiovascular consulting firm. Uh, after having been there for about six years, a former friend from Medtronic called and said they were you know, starting up a healthcare economic service. And uh, I went, had an interview, and now it's 10 years later. And um, I actually, kind of like Anya, I just left my healthcare economics position while I still am reporting within the economic space. I am now starting a startup company related to data uh, and consulting for Medtronic. So, oh, wow. Yeah. You mean an incubation within Medtronic? Exactly. Good for the Medtronic. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to kick off with some questions, but um, if there are, you know, we don't have to wait till I finish all the questions. Like if there are burning desires, you really want to have your questions um, <laughs> asked while we are in the midst of Q&A, please just raise your hand. Um, so, uh, Lisa, why don't we start with you? Um, you know, I'm fascinated by your company. You know, I know a bunch of price transparency companies, Castlight and HealthSpark, which is backed by Cambia. So here you're backed by Cambia. So it says something about how special and differentiated you are. Uh, but let's, you know, I would love to hear s some experience that consumers have shared with you about how they use you, what's the success story, how you reach out to these uh, consumers. Uh, so if you could just give us some idea. Uh, yes, we, it's, it's interesting given this group of people to talk about how we got started. We actually uh, beta tested a Pocket Doc in Los Angeles. And we started with a group of women. We were talking about this at lunch because uh, women are uh, referred to in the industry as home health managers. You know, most women are online at least once a week searching for health information 50% of the time for someone besides themselves. So we targeted that population. Uh, here's the story. We, we went down with a blue prototype to Los Angeles to a group of 40 women from the ages of 25 to 55, and they immediately told us, and no offense to anyone in the room, it can't be blue. It absolutely must not be blue. It makes you look like an insurance company. That makes you look like a hospital. You are our source of information. We don't want you to be them. You know, it's, it's, and I'm not saying anything about how they felt about those companies. They just didn't want us to be them. So when you look at us, we're orange and we're purple and we're, uh, we have a more approachable interface. We really have tried to design the consumer side of the interface to appeal to that woman in particular, not just women, but that female customer in particular. Because even if it's the man's health, the child's health, the parent's health, it's typically that woman who's calling. Uh, what we found is it's usually an increasingly, it's your average, uh, parent, mom, family member at home. Increasingly, especially with this last year, the bulk of us have been moved to or choosing high deductible plans on the exchanges. 
That means it's anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000. I'm on the high range with $7,000. Uh, as one woman said to me, a consumer using our product, I finally understand that more of us will be covered, but will be covered for less. And then I have to start shopping for my healthcare procedures in the same way that I shop for everything else. I have to be smart. I have to ask questions. I have to compare us and shop. I can't just do what my doctor tells me to do any longer. So that's, this is what we're hearing from most of the consumers out there. Most of them are coming to us just to get a sense of, is this the right price? Is there a price? Because, uh, and I'll just say, and this probably won't surprise you, I think about us not as a price transparency app, I think of us as a, as a marketplace. HealthSpark mm -hmm. and CastLight are absolutely price transparency tools. You know, they're great, great applications, great software, they give you a lot of information. But I, as a software creator, I'm always in the business of, of what am I gonna do with that information? At the end of the day, what do I do with it? So can well, I actually buy that service through your website? Yes, in fact, <laughs> and uh, we built it self-service on the provider side, so you can sign up, you can claim your page, this is all for free. You can list a service, you can list a price, you can sell it and collect funds today and put it all in your yeah, own exactly. WePay account, a wow. little merchant account attached to that. We had a guy, we had a provider, we had a doctor in New York do this yesterday in Brooklyn, and we get this all the time. He called up and said, okay, I'm ready to pay for your premium account. What are the prices? And we said, no, that's free. We will give you, we'll charge you for each transaction, a small fee, transactional fee, just on the, on the credit card swipe, but that's it. That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> you can't possibly be giving this for free. What's the catch? But that's it, because it's so hard. I mean, when we started out, we thought we were gonna be consumer focused, and we quickly realized that if we didn't get providers on board, if we didn't communicate the information to the payers, then we could not support these new business models. We could not make it possible for you to shop. That's why we give it away for free to the providers and we just uh, charge a transaction. What's your revenue model as a company? So we do, we take, uh, so we're like a MasterCard. You know, we, mm -hmm. take a, we, we take that transactional fee, so we're about volume as mm -hmm. opposed to you know, net percent per claim. We sell access to the APIs. Uh, the low-level APIs that should be free, they're just a cost of doing business. We give those away for free. Uh, that's, uh, that's a very interesting topic for another day. Uh, for the ones that are specific to our marketplace, we sell. And then we white-label our solution. And by the way, just like Amazon did when it first started, it white-labeled its solution and it sold it to Target. And companies like Target. Yep. So that's what we do. Right. You know, I just have to say, this conversation about high deductible reminded me of a cartoon I used in my newsletter a couple of months ago. It was a very cute cartoon. This couple are at the discharge window at the hospital, and you know the woman is getting discharged, and the administrator says, wow, you have such a great insurance plan. It covers everything except the deductible is equal to your net worth. <laughs> so... <laughs> Moving on, Tamara, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, so tell us a little bit about what, um, what, how your company is involved in this whole price transparency and how you connect the dots. So I'd, I'd rather speak about the industry as a whole. Okay. It's okay. All right. Um, <laughs> All right. You're allowed. Uh, for a number of reasons. But I think that for price transparency, when we think about implantable medical devices, like the world that I've been in for the past 10 or so years, uh, price and cost are often used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. And we also have to think about charges. So when you think about this data, you know, we have different stakeholders. We have hospitals, we have physicians, we have device companies like a lot of us represent here. And we have to think about you know, what it is that we're looking for. Because from a provider perspective, they have charges. And those charges, the cost of a service is reflected in the charges. And so we often look at price and charges and cost all interchangeably. And depending on what the specific question is, we have to think about what is it that we're actually looking for. And there are different data sources, like you mm -hmm. mentioned. This is the first year that Medicare has made physician claims data available for free. 
And this is something that I know that CMS or Medicare um, is looking to have a higher level of transparency like a lot of our government agencies are. So they put this big data dump of physician claim data out on their mm -hmm. website. And it's, ton it's tons of information. But you can look at by physician or specific practice, you know, what codes, what CPT codes were billed, what the charges were, and what the physician was paid. So if you're looking for some type of referral pattern, if you have a new product and you know what CPT codes might be associated with that product, you could possibly pinpoint some customers or look at you know, what the charges are and what the reimbursement is. So I don't know that I answered your question specifically, but it's, it's kind of a broad question depending on what your specific need is. All right, thank you. So Anya, t talk to us about Cardinal Health and price transparency and your efforts. Yeah, so Cardinal Health, we, we think of ourselves really as sort of the business behind healthcare. So we're looking to participate in different areas of healthcare that, that basically help our customers. And we broadly define our customers really as hospital, you know, CEOs or uh, managers of ambulatory practices, et cetera. So to us, um, price transparency or, or um, we kind of frame it in what are our customers really asking for. And that's what led us into products in the first place, away from kind of core distribution. So our customers were saying, we need to get our consumable products cheaper. Well, how do you do that if somebody can own, you know, the entire value chain from manufacturing through delivery, you can drive down the costs and get it cheaper. And then as was mentioned earlier today, product input costs, so your implant cost is really the driver of, um, of procedure costs today. It may not be the biggest portion, labor of course in, in facilities are, but when you look at what can be, how you can take money out of procedure cost, really the most straightforward way to take it out is through changing your input costs. So to us, price transparency is all around partnering with our hospitals and helping them understand what they're really getting. Um, some products are way more valuable than they cost, and that's great. Some products actually deliver much less value than their cost. And we look at that group of products and say, wow, there's a real opportunity for Cardinal to get involved and play in that, that space between what you're paying for a product and what a product is really worth. Uh, and, and we think price transparency is obviously a way to help kind of align everybody to that fact and, and it's where we're going. Thank you. So Sue, I, I was intrigued to know that you're a nurse, so I love having people who actually know something about medicine in your, your kind of uh, <laughs> position, because most of the time we have administrators. Um, but Medtronics is obviously a big company, uh, somewhat I would call them amongst the innovative companies. Um, how do you see price transparency really enmeshed with your business? How are you guys using that concept in your business? So the... Um the venture that I'm currently involved in actually is giving us access to a wealth of data from uh, several hundred hospitals and the hospitals that are joining into that effort are sharing with us their claims data, their quality data, etc. And I know from being a former hospital administrator and uh, working with a product that we actually have been giving away a program uh, free of charge for the last several years. Uh, we've just decided to commercialize it, and, and that's what I'm responsible for. Is It is still astounding to me that um, hospitals themselves remain somewhat insular. Um, it, in the case of this product, obviously the key customer is the um, hospital, but it's also the physician. We have less to do with the end user, so to speak, but the number one reason for hospitals to participate in our program previously was because they didn't have access to benchmark information. They benchmark internally, but they really have no idea. Unless they've been part of a, a provider network of some type, they really don't have that information available to them. Uh, you know, whenever we surveyed them, the number one reason for uh, joining was the access to the benchmarks. The second was uh, provider alignment. So, you know, again, our idea is, you know, just to get it out there, but not only to educate the hospitals and let them see that Medtronic wishes to be a partner, 
but also, you know, it has uh, very valuable applications for Medtronic as well, coming from a, a historic company that has always had the, the patient culturally as a, a focus. Uh, there is still a lot of opportunity within Medtronic as well to learn more about the healthcare delivery side, and we've been able to use some of those historic um, examples to educate our sales force and so forth, so we're trying to bring them into you know, the current environment and be able to speak knowledgeably about you know, what are the, the hospitals facing, what are the physicians facing. Uh, we use it as an educational platform as well. Many times, again, claims data gives you that bird's eye view to see exactly, you know, are they billing and coding appropriately? And while that seems to be fairly fundamental, there is a, a huge disparity in capability out there. So you know, we're, we're taking uh, opportunities to learn from them, but also to share that information and create a network where typically, again, just because of the nature of healthcare, these administrators don't have that many venues in which to talk about uh, best practices or whatever to get really down into the, the detail that's necessary mm -hmm. to affect mm -hmm. change. To set the um, stage for my next question, which is not on these lists that we compared to, so I'm doing something dangerous here. <laughs> Uh, but it's extemporizing is always good, right? So, uh, you know, I told you I'm an early adopter of technology. So I, my first uh, mobile phone was a Motorola brick, literally a brick. And it only worked parts of, you know, uh, my home or parts of the office and maybe, you know, sitting at the corner of my office building outside, soaking the sun and speaking and everybody thought, you know, obviously I was a weirdo. With that, and, and I truly, I think like when I bought it, I can't remember what year it was, I think I saw maybe five more people over several months uh, that were carrying that brick. So, and then the, you know, Motorola Razor came out, which was this much, much smaller device. And, you know, I, I again, not, you know, I was just like, here I was standing with my brick outside my, our building, so why not go across the street and get my lunch while I'm talking on the phone? And I cannot tell you, how many times I w was looked at like, well, who is this weirdo? At one point, I was asked to get off the bus because I was talking on the phone. <laughs> um, so, you know, who would have thought we would be here, right? Uh, if somebody would have asked me, what do you think the next razor can do for you besides the fact that it's a smaller and you can walk around and talk, who would have thought that we're going to have all these apps and everything? So. I like the panelists, and not everybody needs to answer my questions. I know it's a little unfair that I'm extemporizing. I like the panelists to take their crystal ball out and tell us, and this has a lot of relevance to price transparency. It's all about the data democratization. It's prices being out there, consumer being so educated that we can you know, disrobe the payers now and the hospitals, right? Because it, we, we are, you know, we are, we have a lot of power. Information is power. We, price transparency is power. So maybe starting with you, Lisa, um, since you're in price transparency, maybe your crystal ball is bigger than the others. <laughs> um, what do you think, you can answer the question one of two ways. Either what's the next phase of digital health that you guys see, or what's the next phase of price transparency as an empowerment of us consumer can do to the healthcare. Okay, My crystal ball. Uh, well, I will say, and I, I agree with you uh, on how you characterize price, cost, uh, et cetera. It's, I think price transparency is the CD-ROM of our time. Because think about it. If you're buying, some, do you think about price transparency when you go to Amazon? No. Yeah. She just shook her head. <laughs> no, it's you think embedded. about how much it costs, and you want to compare the cost. Okay. That's, why do we think, I mean, it's just a foregone conclusion you're going to see the price. It's not, the, whether or not it's transparent is not an argument. This is what, it, it's the same for anything. We, it's almost a, in my opinion, it's a red herring. We're talking about it while completely avoiding the actual conversation of what it would take to sell something in a retail setting to a consumer from a doctor. So that's why you see us going way down into the guts of the business of health, because the only way you're going to support that 
and make price transparency go away and you being able to see the price. And price is different from cost, very, very different from cost. And it's absolutely true that most health systems today, with a few exceptions in the news, have zero idea how much things cost them. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's something that has to happen. That, I am not going to solve that problem, but that, <laughs> that's something that absolutely has to happen. But the price, being able to see the price and deciding if you as a consumer want to pay it, that absolutely in the next few years will happen. One of the reasons why it will happen is right now the the pipes where that information is exchanged uh, have been a black box. They, they haven't been modernized, they've been a back black box, no one's had access to that for a lot of very specific reasons because it hides price, it hides contracted rates, it suppresses cost information. Uh, there were a lot of reasons for that, I don't want to get into why they were, but going forward that can't be supported. Uh, people paying for health care will no longer allow that to be supported. Those pipes are already getting disintermediated into other areas by people like us. So once that information is flowing freely, which it will, then price becomes really interesting. Price becomes based on time and need and perceived value and competition. And those are things that, I mean, yes, were we talking about 5, 10, 15 years? Absolutely. But it's coming. That is the crystal ball. That it's not, that's not going to go away. Now, there are huge, powerful companies who would prefer that I fall into a crack <laughs> as I go outside that door and disappear absolutely. forever. Um, <laughs> yep. And I'd like to say that exactly the same thing was uh, said by the head of Delta to the founder of Priceline when he went in for the first time. And then Delta became their best customer. So I think uh, this is happening and is evolving. It's a really interesting conversation to have about uh, price versus cost. And we as consumers will start to demand that. And I absolutely predict that these programmable interfaces as announced by, by Apple is one of the most exciting things in terms of shifting the center of gravity elsewhere to drive, uh, to drive that conversation. Thank you. And, and to build on, on what you're saying, one of the things that's been really interesting to me over the past couple of months is the number of hospital system customers that are talking about the value of a patient and that are actually making the distinction between kind of, okay, someone comes in for an episode of care, I can, you know, kind of the manufacturing thing, how many procedures, tests, et cetera, can I do to them? That's what we make. And they're viewing the patient kind of just in that box. That was what used to happen. And now thinking about, OK, if I can much more of a consumer approach, what, what patient groups are worth it for me to target? Because they will end up being, over the long term, very valuable to me as patients. And how do I change their experience uh, to make them more likely to come back. Almost like airline frequent flyer miles. Wow, if I can give you know, this patient that I think might, might have a longer term value to me a private room, even though we're charging them the same, but these kind of little benefits and that distinction is night and day, for me anyway, in my experience versus what it used to be. And I think a lot of that is driven by if prices truly become transparent, Right? And now people have to be sold to in much more that consumer-oriented way. And providers need to think differently uh, about how they attract patients and what they do. Any other comments from the panel? I would just, I would just add, you know, talking about the black box, as you mentioned, uh, the black box of healthcare finance, which I've been in for a number of years. Um, I think because we use, the private payers often use Medicare payment data as the benchmark. And the way that that data is compi compiled for physicians and hospitals, they have these very technical formulas so that cost and um, cost is derived um, as part of reimbursement. That may be something that needs to be unwound because you need a PhD to figure out how these formulas work or you need a really smart analyst uh, that can figure it out um, on the physician side as well as on the hospital side. But I think something 
uh, something like that will change eventually because we do want more transparency. We do want to understand why Medicare pays more for an MRI, you know, in one location versus another location. So I think that we will see that change, but until um, Medicare makes a fundamental change in the way that payment rates are designed, you know, we'll have to continue to poke as you're doing. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> So, I'm just a professional poet. No, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's fascinating. No, I, I like it. Great point. But I, I like it. I think one other quick point, and perhaps I'm being a little bit more linear in my thinking, I agree with everything that these ladies have said, but I think it also gets back to med tech's delivery model, if you will, because right now, obviously, a lot of our cost is tied up in you know, sales representation, et cetera, and that procedural support. So, you know, I, I, I can tell you that you know Medtronic is obviously looking at uh, differentiated delivery models, but we're already seeing the demise of uh, triple vendor systems, dual vendors, going down to single vendors. So you know, how do you start to eliminate some of those uh, human resource costs, quite frankly, and how do you leverage the technology? Thank you very much. I'd like to turn it to the audience. I see one question there. Is there a microphone? I'll stand up and yell. Um, so. Please introduce yourself and uh, tell the audience what you do because yeah, I know um, what you do and that's very yeah, interesting. Thank you. I'm Joe Carol Hyatt. I'm with Kaiser Permanente and I'm a general surgeon in the Southern California Permanente Medical Group. Um, the one segment in healthcare that has had price transparency forever is cosmetic surgery. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's not reimbursed. It's <laughs> no, well, exactly. So, it, but, but what I, my point is that for some reason, consumers in healthcare yeah. have equated quality with more money. Yeah. If it costs more, it's better. You Fantastic. can get a facelift in Beverly Fantastic. Hills for about four times what you can get the same operation in San Bernardino. Yep. So is the consumer ready for the appropriate behavioral response to price transparency? There's an, right. a flipped perception that right. more money is better healthcare. No, that's very good. And you know what I was thinking the other day, and uh, is, uh, and I think you might have, I, I haven't used your site, so I don't know. You know what I was thinking? Would it be nice to find a site that, you know, maybe I'll search for, you know, price of a knee replacement, right? But then I can compare it next to the stars of the facility or the doctor. So Jesus, he's the cheapest, but look, he has only one star. Forget it. I'm not going to go. So it's, it's some kind of a value-based comparison, quality-based price comparison. So I think that could be really helpful to consumers. Don't you agree? If you spend a ton, you're going to rate it really high because you want to justify the <laughs> yeah. So what, but, I have to but, speak to so, this because this is really close okay. to my heart. Um, and I think about so it speak. completely differently, which, of course, what well, a big surprise. But um, I don't think it's a problem. I, I, in fact, I, I like to say, uh, what if consumers spent more money and that was a good thing? Because this goes back to your cost versus spend mm -hmm. conversation. The cost of health care, we actually have zero idea what the actual cost of health care is. We know how much we spend and we don't know whether or not that's something that consumers want to spend or not want to spend because they don't know what they're spending it on and they don't know where their money's going. If I did, this is where the price transparency, bless you, goes, is uh, um, if I did, what do I care? It, this, is, this is where I say to the, the health community at large, you, in a consumer-driven market, you gotta put the burden down. There is no appropriate amount. There's only what the consumer wants to spend. Yep. There's no appropriate amount. Very and if good. you convince them to spend it, and they want to, and they're happy about it, because they know what they spent it on, then what I would redefine, I wouldn't call it cost of healthcare anymore, I would call it healthcare spin, drive it up. You know, you want, this is an opportunity. No other industry in the world would look at that and go, oh, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, they'd be trying to drive it up, but make you as a consumer happier about it and, 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 ben and absolutely get a benefit from the dollars. If I could just add, um, I think what we struggle to define in healthcare is value. And that's basically what you were saying. So if there is a new treatment, say you're a chronic pain patient and you've suffered with chronic pain for 20 years, and there's a new therapy that can reduce your pain by 95%. And you know, of course, cost and price 
come into place, but how do you put a value on how much better you feel? And how does a payer put a value on all those additional treatments like opioids and steroid injections and physical therapy, all of those other treatments that you no longer need? So it's, I think that's, our, that's your key that you were talking about, Afsana, that we struggle to define in this industry. Yeah. But, but I think there are areas where we do have data to make better decisions and to kind of incorporate that type of thing. What's the price? What, how good is this physician in terms of his uh, severity adjusted outcome scores or her severity adjusted outcome scores, you know, in all, in all these different metrics, which if we could put it together in one place, uh, we could actually ask the right questions today. Um, because the data's there, we know what questions we want to ask, but the data's not set up in a way that can answer it. Um, and that's a matter of time. Uh, I don't think anybody would argue that, that, that that's not coming. I, I think I'm just going to be a bit of a contrarian. I'm, I live in Pennsylvania, and there was data published by the Healthcare Cost Containment Council, HC4 as it's known in Pennsylvania, and they looked at the cost and the outcomes risk adjusted for open heart surgery for a number of years. And after that report was published, it was in the local media, et cetera, it did not change. They looked year over year, it did not change behavior. I mean, now it, with the advent of high deductible plans and so forth, you know, that of course is going to drive some change, but I think that it still is a ways off, quite frankly. Don't make me depressed. <laughs> <laughs> we got we to end this with an up mode. You have some questions from the audience. Yeah, one of the questions that um, has popped up a couple times, in your estimation, how much uh, of costs will be driven down simply by trace, price transparency pressures? Sounds like... Uh, there's a, uh, yeah. I, I think it's a couple percentage points every year is what we're seeing, yeah. whether it's IMS data, whatever. Yeah, I would agree with that. There, there's a floor, right? Because things, if it's a product, it actually costs something to, you know, to make. And so um, lots of different factors in that, but there's a floor. And there have been a bunch of studies that have tried to quantify the impact of price transparency, and I've never seen anything in the double digits. Usually it's around kind of 2 to 4 percent. Yeah. I would love to see, um, I would love to see uh, qualifying for reimbursement not come until after uh, establishment of market demand, but um, uh, we have an economist, used to be at MIT, now he's at the University of Chicago, and his specialty is new markets, and uh, he's an angel investor in the company. And he is constantly pushing me to test exactly that. How, how will price transparency affect uh, the lowering of price in a market? You know, just releasing it. So we're, we're doing it in a couple cities right now, and we'll, we'll get back to you on that. It's interesting. You know, I have to say, again, just being a student of uh, technology, you know, if you look at cost of telecommunication, if you look at uh, cost of flying, um, look at uh, gas prices uh, um, after fracking, even in inflation adjusted uh, oil prices have stayed fairly flat uh, because of better EMP technology. So, you know, horizontally speaking, technology has leveled the playing fields in a lot of places, a lot of places. And I think if we think about price transparency as a technology, I think my dial tone kind of, uh, you know, I got the dial tone because data democratization, when, uh, you know, this is something I've, I've kind of empirically had a mini study with a bunch of uh, hospitals and also uh, doctors. Like, when my colleague puts that price out, when this hospital that competes with me puts that price out, you know what? Actually, this guy who came to me yesterday trying to sell me this analytics about figuring out my, you know, service line profitability, I actually bought the damn thing. You know, my CIO has been bugging me about buying that package, but I bought it because it's enough is enough. I got to, I guess, participate in this. So it's almost like, you know, if I don't get into it, I'm going to lose the game. And I really feel, I don't know whether it's 2% or 5%, but I think we ain't seen nothing yet. I think we 
whatever we are in our 30s and 40s and 50s are going to have some, you know, we're going to save some money, but I think our children, my daughter, I mean, she has such a sense of entitlement about n wanting to know every price of everything and everything, you know, she goes on different sites to compare prices or, you know, sends out a message to her Facebook friends to compare prices. So, you know, it's, it's an entitlement that a lot of young people have about they want to know the prices. And I have a feeling it may start at 2-3%, mm -hmm. but I, I think we're, not, we're gonna, I'm very, very hopeful. I don't know, five years maybe, seven years maybe, but I think we're gonna see some material shift um, in, in, in healthcare costs being bent for price transparency. That's my opinion. Any other question from that? I, I just had one. Do you see uh, the changes in the hospital itself being uh, uniquely different now that in, you know, the, the combination of hospitals becoming now insurers that is a trend in the business, topic. and I think that's a, that something that I'm very interested in. But I also have one little funny story to tell you. While we were talking about all this, I got an email from Aetna, who has just denied my daughter, who has severe ADHD, <laughs> her focal in for a couple of days. And I, and I, while this panel was going on, I said, I emailed her back, and I said, whoever denied that, I'll send my daughter to go live with them <laughs> for, the, for the next two weeks, and he'll, I'm sure he'll, he'll uh, approve everything. So some things are, um, are all, you know, I think some things are never going to change, and it's going to take a long, long time, but the whole construct of a hospital becoming the payer, I think, is really going to be uh, something that we're going to be looking forward to. Yeah, thank you for that. I have a very strong opinion about that, but yeah. the panel wants to... So we see, this is a huge issue right now for Cardinal, or, or big in terms of how we think about it. In fact, there are, our CEO talks about five key drivers that our business is sort of ob obsessed by and, and is informing a lot of our strategic plan in their access, obviously with the Affordable Care Act, um, the change in consumer-driven, Healthcare, so really the the um, I liken it to we all used to have defined benefit plans and we went to defined contribution plans and you know the whole that whole part of the financial industry exploded right and changed pretty radically so similar to that aging in place digitization and then provider consolidation so it's something that we're spending a ton of time with and as we think about it an incredibly meaningful shift is happening where. We used to think of the places where care was delivered as the revenue centers. And it's becoming a cost center and the overlying entity is now the revenue center. So that whole mentality about how we as a management team of a hospital system um, are gonna manage is changing from viewing, I mean think about in your own company. If you used to be a revenue center, and now your company is just thinking of your department as a cost center, you're going to be treated completely differently. What you have access to is completely different. I mean, that, it's, it's really kind of a fundamental shift. And that's one of the things that we see happening as both uh, big hospital organizations combine, even if they're still only provider or if it's a payer-provider combination. Any other panelists? Uh we uh, are currently working with a large hospital system, 30 hospital system, 73,000 employees of their own. They have their own plan. And one of the interesting shifts that we see them making is using us as an e-commerce solution, a front-end e-commerce solution. Uh, because they, with the ACO, with all of the newly insured, with high deductible plans, they're seeing their reimbursement rates drop, and that's going to collections. It's not. They're not, not, not capturing that after the encounter. So they're, uh, they're looking at new ways, and they can, um, we have to work with other plans on their behalf, uh, which they broker, but they're able to test these fully enclosed e-commerce solutions themselves because they own the provider, they own the plan, they have their own a significant employee base. So that, that is really interesting to me. And they're, they're seeing as an opportunity to build out that solution, build out a new set of, of uh, e-commerce pipes around that, and then roll that out to other mm -hmm. systems. So thank you very much. I am so glad you brought that up because it's been an area I've studied and I, you know, we have done some research at the firm. So let me give you a couple of pieces of statistics. 
Aetna is the largest employer of doctors. They're an insurance company, okay? That bought a ton of, and they're not just the only one, Humana also. They, these guys own a ton of doctors. So that's just an interesting piece of data point for you. And, um, you know, many hospitals are, already have their employees uh, under their plan as self-insurance. And um, what, is, what is insurance risk? Risk assessment is insurance. So I know a company in the Valley who is now still um, kind of in a stealth mode that is working on an insurance in a box. So basically it's a health insurance. It's a risk assessment methodology that they will plug into all kinds of their databases and they're working with a couple of other data analytics companies already that are present in hospitals to help migrate the vision of me as a hospital becoming an insurance company. So it's very, very exciting. And why is that? So there is a reason when the CEO of Edna says in every single earnings call or analyst uh, uh, presentation, he says, in X amount of years, Edna will have only 20 to 30% of their earnings come from insurance. That's why. Because insurance companies, if you just kind of take it to the extreme, insurance companies are going to do a couple of things. Obviously, you know, Aetna has providers. Aetna has a, a very, you know, pretty decent platform for HIT. Um, they do a lot of things for patients for free. But they're going to be administrators of the insurance plans that these hospitals own. That's one area they're going to get into. And the other area they're going to get into, which is, again, something that I'm studying, and I can tell you it's just kind of is at the very intellectual level is being seriously discussed with some uh, uh, health plans, is I will be provider of capital to these hospitals so they can start their own insurance company. So they will be like lenders. I lend you capital. Can you imagine what kind of a world we will be if that happens? And it will happen. It will happen. It's being presently studied by health plans that are meeting with these providers that are saying, how can I help you become your own insurance company? Let me also say another thing. So there is a hospital in New York that actually said, we're going to uh, have our, you know, we, we're going to do a cost containment because they, they have some limited self-insurance, and see how we could help bring the cost of our ED patients. So, so everybody was much more aware about, not, okay, you know, let's give, them, give her less oxygen to save money. <laughs> it wasn't that, but it's like workflow. What are we doing with the workflow in our ED to save money? And this is one example of a patient. So this hospital in New York, used to get this elderly woman once or twice a week in an emergency room. Oh, my chest hurts, oh, my back hurts, and obviously, by law, they have to take her in. And she became a frequent flyer. And so now that the, the ED has a higher awareness about how can we help this workflow, somebody sat her down and said, do you have a doctor? She said, yeah. Where is the doctor? 30 blocks away. Where do you live? I live around the corner. So what this hospital did, they're actually giving, giving her a monthly staple of money, the hospital, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to go to the doctor before you come. That's how they save a lot of money. So what, the level of awareness is, is, is amazing. But you know, I see the day, for sure, as this risk assessment methodologies become more and more, become easier to use for these hospitals to become captive insurance companies. I see a lot of those stories actually happening. So any other questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, there's um, two on the app. One is, um, what are some examples of traditional med device or med tech products that are being affected by price transparency? And then sort of second to that, um, on the med tech company side of things, are there ways to influence patients or communicate to patients 
the value and importance of perhaps having a higher quality yet higher cost procedure that would utilize one of their, their technologies. Please. Um, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, first thing, uh, in terms of the impact of transparency on the companies, I do you want to repeat that question again just to make sure I'm answering it? Yeah, correctly? the first one, just some examples of traditional med tech or med device products that have been affected by price transparency. Right. I can tell you, uh, certainly for defibrillators uh, coming from Medtronic, I, I believe it was in 2010 or 2012, the um, GAO did a study mm -hmm. looking at the pricing of medical devices, whether it was orthopedic implants or cardiac. and. Um, they subpoenaed, uh, I think it was about 60 hospitals originally, I believe about 32 of them actually responded, but they actually made a comment upon the variance in pricing for similar types of devices. So, you know, subsequent to that, the Department of Justice has certainly been looking at the appropriateness of defibrillators, for example. They've set up uh, a series of appropriateness criteria and so forth. It has definitely had an impact on the business. Any other comments? I would just say with um, the space I've been in for neurostimulators, um, price transparency over the past few years, I know there have been audits as well as, as you mentioned, but I think when hospitals know the price that each company is um, selling for, it really keeps the price at a constant level. So in the seven or so years that I've been in the market, there have been you know new products that come out that have a price premium, but ultimately, um, those prices come in line with everything else. And so it keeps the market more stable based on my experience. Thank you. I'll just say, I'll just add from a consumer's perspective, what I'm noticing, and we see this primarily in the ambulatory surgical market and those groups that are on pocket doc is they were list bundle prices. Uh, we have a number of groups that list bundle prices, including uh, surgeon, anesthesiologists, and facility fee. But, and I don't know why this is, maybe you can tell me, almost always, and in fact, in every case that I can think of on Pocket Doc today, they list hardware as extra, and they won't post a price. Mm -hmm. So Probably. whether or not that's true, mm -hmm. it makes you guys look like the bad guys. <laughs> and that, that's, and you don't want that. So if it's not true, uh, you know, ha, ha, okay, so it's true. <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll address that. So it, I think it's, it, the answer is it depends mm -hmm. because it yeah. really depends on what the patient needs. So what, what I've done in my past is, you know, once a patient is an appropriate candidate, let's say for a spinal cord stimulator, they can work with their insurance company and or their facility, you know, hospital, ASC, wherever they're having that procedure to say, this is what I'm having, these are the codes that are involved, what is the charge, and what is my insurance benefit? So I think when you have a better, you know, per patient, that, that value is going to differ. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why there's not a, a price there. But if you put an average and somebody goes beyond that average, then consumers get upset. Mm -hmm. But you just, and, and that's, I think, a struggle that, mm -hmm. that we'll just have to continue to educate our patients on. But I think the opportunity as well in terms of, um, providing information about the improvement of outcomes and so forth. Uh, pharma has been very successful in terms of doing you know, quantification of, of value or the efficacy of, of their uh, medications. I think that is still is somewhat uh, new territory for medical device companies. We certainly are in an arms race, so to speak, to have um, appropriate outcomes research, uh, being the data being collected on a consistent basis and being analyzed. and you know, and really doing something beyond large meta-analyses of, of databases. So I think that, you know, we're headed in the right direction. I mean, you had a, what you can see now, just no discussion is probably complete without quickly mentioning GPOs, right? right? So what, what you can <laughs> see now is on the spectrum of true commodity consumable device to completely physician preference um, device, it's, it's a big spectrum. And you've seen GPOs marching down that spectrum. And the GPO model involves a lot of price transparency, at least among their customers or member base, not necessarily the end user patients. But you know, as that march happens, I think you'll see more and more and more of what we consider med tech products involved in that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You had a second question. Oh. 
I think. Yeah, and I think Sue touched on some of that, which was um, how do med tech companies influence or convey to patients the importance of perhaps having a higher quality at okay. higher cost procedures. So, so I think you kind of opened yeah, that up. That, I, I think the other, but the other thing, too, that we were talking or touching upon in some of the previous uh, panel discussions was, again, uh, taking on risk-based contracting as manufacturers. And, you know, it certainly is something that we're exploring. Very important. I would just also, I mean, it, it is phenomenal, and I am so impressed by the amount of data that this group has about its own products, the amount of work and research it's done to ensure that its products have uh, valid data and can present that. We had a really interesting conversation at lunch today with the value of marketing um, and, and the challenges of marketing if you haven't announced some of the concepts in the marketing when you presented, <laughs> presented the product for FDA approval, you can't use those words in your marketing, and this is... Just, I'm exhausted even listening to this, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's yeah, tough. I mean, it's like uh, go, go forth, fight, don't, don't stop. But um, it, it's it, we talked about the concept of it, it. That kind of rational information does not make someone want to buy your product. It tells them why they should. Absolutely. Doesn't make them want to. Just going to throw in one final comment on this very specific to medtech is even if everything works. Can you please wait for the? I have a loud voice though. <laughs> um, even if everything were commoditized, I mean, total transparency. And I started out my life as a commodities trader, so there is the ultimate commodities market. Um, there is in medtech the the personal touch of who's ever doing the procedure, and you can't. It's very hard to value that. And they, they started doing that in Europe, where they have centers of excellence, so only certain physicians, only certain surgeons can perform certain procedures because they do it better. And um, that may wow. come here soon. But uh, yeah, so there are a lot of procedures, for example, ERCP, for one, where uh, it's not offered in every hospital in Europe. It's only a few in, in every country. So it's all, they start realizing the value of the, the actual artist who's doing the procedure too, so that's another factor that's very, very unique to MedTech. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Questions? Questions? No questions. There's one over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, go ahead. And after you're finished, I think the lady next to you also has a question. So this might be a little bit of a flyer question. Um, maybe it's in the context of learning. And Lisa, I guess I would most be interested in your thoughts. Is this a US phenomena, the concept of digital health, and rooted in just the very high and currently unsustainable costs of health care in the US? Certainly, many developed markets would argue for that. but. Are the digital health aspects happening in other places around the world? And where are there lessons or bright spots that are working? Or is it truly just new frontier, the entire topic, I guess I would say? Uh, so I'll answer that two ways. It's absolutely worldwide and differing on the market and the needs of the market. Uh, I was just in Finland and when I was there, f for whatever reason, Finland's got a huge number of health startups yep. uh, and digital health startups. <laughs> and I happen to know a couple of the founders there and I was meeting with them and it, it is a vibrant community. They'll even be renting out, a, they're sponsoring a whole room at Health 2O if you're going to that. So you can go see everything that they're doing in Finland. And they consider, uh, of course, Finland's a small country so they consider uh, the U.S. one of their primary markets uh, for, and these are wellness applications. These are all the same sorts of things you would think about. But I think um, some of the most interesting work is being done in developing countries because they're less constrained by regulation. Uh, they have more immediate needs, uh, really critical, like, oh my God, how am I gonna prevent Ebola from you know, spreading kinds of needs. So they're putting some fascinating, and, and all of them have jumped to mobile quickly because they couldn't afford to put the landlines in, in place. So they're starting in terms of developing a lot of their technologies almost farther along the curve than we are because they didn't have so many legacy systems in yep. place. So this is, that's the area that's really interesting to me is what could we learn from them? Uh, and 
and also they're doing, um, I, I wish I could remember the exact example, but even I was listening to a man describe what he put in place um, in India for, uh, and he was using the trucking system because it was, it was what he could track. He knew that it always had a consistent delivery cycle and he was using it for some kind of healthcare you know, analog where he was delivering healthcare along this trucking system. And it was, and it was just brilliant in its simplicity and brilliant in its creativity. So I think that's, uh, when you look at what PATH up in Seattle is doing, uh, even the, you know, the Gates Foundation uh, has its challenges, but they're, they're funding some interesting things that are worth looking at in the developing nations. So I'd like to make a couple of comments because there was a speaker at the SOCAP last week in San Francisco, which is all about you know how we help third world countries on the whole digital health. And so I so said it's good news, bad news. I mean, the good news is that they don't have to deal with the FDA. They just have to show what I call basic safety. And so you have a ton of entrepreneurs who are going to that market to especially provide care in remote areas is a big problem. Uh, the bad news is the funding is a huge issue. Uh, you know, is who, who's funding them to get off the ground. And so, so in Europe, in particular, there is a ton of digital health accelerators. They're probably two to three years behind the U.S. We only have 50 here, I stopped counting. Uh, but over there, they're just starting. And you know, ironically, a lot of them are funded by IBM and some of the big players in the space uh, who are going after that. There are certain countries that are way ahead of where we are. A country like Holland and Denmark, I will say, are ahead of the U.S. in digital health. And if you go to Health 2.0 and pay the $2,000 instead of Health Tech Capital, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> they have a judging competition uh, on the Dutch company. There's like 15 companies presenting. And, and so, so it's a very, very, very active space. And, and don't assume the US uh, is really where it's happening there. Some of these other markets are moving faster. They may be later in starting on the innovation side, but they're faster in the implementation side because the governments are getting involved. Yeah, actually, to amplify what Anne just said, uh, Stacy, there's, um, I was just working on a, a, a report for ex on accelerators, on digital health accelerators for the California Health Care Foundation that will be coming out in about a month, so look for it. And uh, there's about 100 digital health accelerators or medical rela health care related accelerators, about 20 of them are not in the U.S., maybe more. And that's just the ones I could find. And um, but there's organizations like Health Excel, which is in Dublin. It's doing worldwide matching of large corporations and digital health companies to, to find ways of them working together. There's a very robust community around this stuff in Germany um, and in the countries, particularly the um, uh, you know, Sweden, Denmark, or that whole world. Um, so it's, a, it's pretty remarkable what's going on. And I actually think the part of the reason for that is because they actually have, in many of those countries, aligned financial incentives in their healthcare systems, which we do not yet, although we're trying to get there. Um, and I think that enables a lot of the technology to be tested more readily and more logically, right? So in the UK, you're starting to see a lot of it in France and others. So I think there's actually pretty sophisticated stuff going on outside the US, not just in third world countries, but in you know, other places in the middle. So. Well, you know, Europe was where wireless uh, was born, so you would expect them at least, especially the Nordic countries like uh, uh, Finland. You know, they have always been ahead in um, in wireless. And in my you know uh, career, I've noticed that you know U.S. and Israel are really, really good in search and are really, really good in algorithm for data analysis. But wireless, you know, is definitely something that Europe, you know, has done a great job. Questions? I, I think I saw, yes. Yeah, I have a, a question um, based on a story, and uh, Tamara will relate to this well. But I was actually talking to a colleague in medical devices, and they were a CFO who was heading up benefits administration as well, and he had a back procedure. And the surgeon recommended a procedure that they cover um, I think it was spinal fusion or something to do that, but it was around $60,000 um, for the insurance company. And he talked to his doctor, and his doctor said there's this new technology, it's around $3,500, it's the Virtuos procedure. And uh, so he, you know, given that he negotiates their benefits contract, he called the company and said, you know, I want this procedure, I realize it's experimental investigational, deemed by you, but it would save you a lot of money. Well, he still, given all of his connections, couldn't convince the insurer to pay it. So he paid for it out of pocket. 
And I guess my question for the panel is, can, is there an opportunity for cost transparency to help patients influence the payers to help cover situations like that because they're fighting the experimental investigational coverage battle and how can we get that type of data in front of patients where they can make an informed de decision and put pressure on payers? Well, um, you know, one way before, one way is for the hospital to be the insurance company as well. They would, in nanosecond, approve that 3,500. Anyway, go on. So I, I can start um, since I have experience with Vertos. Uh, I spent <laughs> a little time there. Um, but one thing I think we need to remember as startup companies, price is one component. The other component that payers won't really want to see is clinical evidence and clinical effectiveness. Because if you can't demonstrate that your procedure, even though it's a far less cost, if it's not as effective, and it's not just the surgeon saying, hey, this is just as good as another procedure that's been tried and true, even though the more invasive procedure is more expensive, if the payer isn't convinced in your published peer-reviewed science mm -hmm. that your new therapy, your new technology is just as good and just as effective, unfortunately, they're gonna come back to you and say, that's a great story. You know, prove it to me in a randomized control trial. Mm -hmm. Prove it to me in some type of trial that is very rigorous and gives me that level of data. And I think that is the quandary that we're in when you have a procedure that's new, that's co less costly, more cost efficient, um, but we have to prove in the data, uh, with the data, that the, the procedure is just as good or better. Well, and all the federally mandated uh, registries that are coming about, I mean, we're investing millions uh, yeah. for that longitudinal data that is becoming part and parcel of any type of launch of a new product. That's right. I have zero faith that I will convince a private payer to pay for, like, like what I got. I, I don't think, I, I, I don't think it will happen. I do think, you know, in hospital situations where they have the, the plan baked in um, and they offer that procedure, absolutely. So that all, I think that is, uh, you'll, and, and it would be interesting if we went to the centers of excellence uh, type of model in, in Europe, then you'd have hospitals yeah. who specialize in certain things, and if you wanted there, to. There actually some are, actually, in New York. There are a couple of hospitals that are shedding some of their wings and operations because they want to just be good and mm -hmm. treat it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I am the one for open heart surgery, for high risk. So one other thing is Medicare is trying to be a little more transparent, um, and they have a new type of coverage, which you guys may have heard of, called coverage with evidence development. So when you go to them and ask for coverage on a national basis for a new technology or a new therapy, but they don't think your data is quite there yet, they will offer coverage on a limited basis as long as all of the patients that are being covered or in some type of study or in some type of registry. So even though the wheels are moving very slowly, they're moving. So um, you know, we'll see how this is a, a, a fairly new concept in the last few years. So we'll see how it goes and changes over the next few it's years. Encouraging. It is encouraging. Yeah. It is. Questions, comments? Are we allowed to uh, wrap up 10 minutes early? You have one question. One more question. Oh, sorry. There's Go one ahead. more from the app here. Um, and someone was wondering if there's anyone um, from a payer perspective in the room who can speak to how they're using digital health to optimize costs and outcomes. So basically, it seems clear that they're already implementing some of their own digital strategies internally. Yeah. Um, and rather than having us operate on a parallel path with them, should we be able to somehow leverage what they're doing or sort of harmonize approaches? We need more payers. Please be invited next time. <laughs> You have to put that in the app. Please. Thank God you're here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Kaiser Permanente is is an unusual animal in that, for those of you that are not California residents and aren't as familiar, we are uh, we are the payer, but we're also the provider and everything everything else that goes with it, the insurer. So um, uh, and also we are our own largest account because we have many hundreds of thousands of uh, 
members uh, that are employees and dependents and physicians. So we have um, approached the digital opportunity. In fact, I'm responsible for it for Southern California, primarily because uh, two years ago, in anticipation of the Affordable Care Act impact, very concerned about how could we possibly accommodate what we were thinking might be literally hundreds of thousands of new members all of a sudden in January of this year. And we um, were very concerned about the capacity because we own and operate our own hospitals in California. We can't really outsource a lot of that without uh, costing us a tremendous amount of money. And we think that we provide better care within our fully integrated system. We know where everybody is. We've got the electronic medical record. So we thought that uh, digital health and virtual care offered an opportunity to very quickly create capacity and efficiency in our system. I will tell you that from the physician and provider perspective, and we, by the way, have had secure messaging email for years. That, that, was, that was old news for us. Um, but some of the things that we thought we could potentially automate uh, and, um, and allow the members to really participate in their own care are somewhat challenging technically for us, and we would appreciate some help. Um, an example would be patients that have had hip or knee replacements. Once they're stabilized, they're doing well a year or so post-op. We have a, a registry with um, well over 200,000 implants in it now. It's as large as Sweden. Um, and uh, we thought that we could help maintain the registry integrity because we just need a couple questions every three years from the patients. How are they, what's their exercise tolerance and what's their pain level? If they're having any problems, of course, they need to come in. And we need new images of their implant. So we thought we could automate that with the electronic medical record, that they could get a notice, uh, that it was uh, time for them to get their images obtained wherever they wanted to do that, any of our locations fine, and also answer these questions, and we'd be done with it. They wouldn't need to come in and see the orthopedic surgeon. Even in our system where our physicians are all salaried, it's an interesting conversation. Um, the physicians are very attached to these patients. They've seen them for years, and they're friends, and they bring them a bottle of wine, and they find out how the grandkids are doing and all that. And they don't like giving up that relationship. That was difficult, but we're, we're working on that. Um, but it was really targeted for us, not so much the trying to reduce our cost as, as really trying to figure out how we were going to have the capacity in our system to take care of a lot more people a lot more efficiently. Virtual care on the video side is, for the providers, not more efficient. It, if you're lucky and if people f can work the technology, it's kind of a one for one, but um, it's way more efficient for the patients. They don't have to drive in or do whatever. One of my favorites, and this may turn out to be huge value, um, is uh, lactation care. So the brand new mother, home, screaming kid, two in the morning. We're not doing it at two in the morning. I wish we could. I'd love to be able to do that because we're in so many time zones. And I think we should be able to provide 24-7 coverage for this. But the lactation consultant can visualize the struggle that the mother and baby are having with an iPhone or whatever at the home setting and an iPad in the office and provide consultation to the mother so she doesn't ever even have to leave her bedroom. She can get the baby uh, settled and, and continue hopefully successful breastfeeding. I think there are all kinds of opportunities on that front that the costs are going to be very hard to determine, but one of the things that I personally love about KP is we actually don't care that much about the cost part of it if the outcomes benefit is there. And the earlier example about the um, experimental treatment, um, if we have a physician who wants to you know, do that, we're, we're not getting an approval from an insurance company. It's our physicians making that decision. That's the right thing to do. Thank you. I'd like to say, um, uh, tell you a little bit about Apple, and then we'll close. So one of the things that you guys may or may not know, and I just wanted to put it out there, so it's you know about their healthcare development uh, environment, et cetera, et cetera. Great, I watch, great. But something you may not know is Apple is talking to Epic, 
which until Siemens and uh, Cerner merged, it was the largest EHR company. And they're talking to Cleveland Clinic. And a lot of the information on our wearable, they want to create an environment that that information goes straight to the EHR. So it's a consumer, constant consumer interface with their EHR. I can bet you it's going to happen. Apple is spending a lot of time on it. Epic is, uh, you know, deployed at, at Cleveland Clinic. That's why Cleveland Clinic is involved here. This has nothing to do with price transparency, but it has to do with what technology is doing to our healthcare system. And what, it, you know, we ain't seen nothing yet, guys. I can tell you it's a very, very exciting time. I, I don't think we have ever been here, as I said in the early part of my discussion, is the confluence of technologies, I think the availability of capital. Thank God this is America. We may have a lot of FDA regulations, but we don't have any regulations for capital. So, you know, at least we got that going. So you got, you got so, you know, societal imperatives. You got availability of capital for all these innovators to do startups. And you really have the technology, the confluence of technology. It's, I think it's a beautiful world out there and I really appreciate the contribution of the panel and thank you for giving me the chance to be here. <laughs>